so good. How's everybody doing this morning? Come on, let me know where you're at. Are you happy to be in church? Are you? Listen, I'm going to put a little bit of heat on you this morning. I feel like uh, we were at our conference, as Pastor Troy mentioned, and it was life-giving. It was life-changing. And that's just the culture and DNA of this house. And so what I want to ask you to do, I, I want to set some culture. Let's take a step in the culture of this house today. If you're hearing from God's word and it is, it's actually meaning something to you, would you like get a little bit excited today? Would you be like, come on, pastor, right? Like, don't do it for me. Do it for you. And here's why. Uh, because, I mean, look, look at last week in the NBA finals. Anybody? NBA finals? Hockey was going on too, but right? Like no Canadian teams have been in there since the 60s. So who cares? Um, <laughs> So NBA Finals, you had, the, you had the Golden State Warriors versus the Cleveland Cavaliers, right? Now, if you had shown up, did, I said Cavaliers like I don't speak English. Anyways, um, so if you'd shown up to one of those games, there's a couple ways that you could have postured yourself at the game. You could go to those games and you could sit back with your arms crossed and be like, oh, lovely game. And you could even knit if you wanted to. No one's going to tell you, like, you bought the ticket, you've got to do anything. But here's the thing. If you got up and you were like, yeah! Let's go, it's amazing, go Durant, you're so great, right? Same game, different experience because of the way the experience is received. And the same is with your faith. And so that's why we don't, when, you're, when you're engaged both physically and verbally in church, it's not for my benefit. I'm going to go home and enjoy God's word, whether you're with me or not. Like, I'm, I'm all right, my, like, I'm, my soul's good. But for your sake, just get engaged, right? Like, it's God's word if it's, like, and so this is, listen, if you don't want to say, come on, pastor, if you want to be, if you're the more silent type, this, you just like, put your hand up like this and just like, <laughs> which actually means that was good. Yes, I'm with you. I don't know how, but somewhere along the way, um, yeah, so just get involved, get engaged in God's word. We're, uh, we're, let's go, let's go, let's go. Uh, yeah, we are in week number two, as Pastor Troy said, of our My Story series, and this story, this series is about building faith. God wants to build up your faith. God is glorified when you live with an active, death-defying, out-of-the-box faith. And so God is committed to grow your faith. God is not just wanting you to enter into a salvation experience where you're like, I got a home in heaven and like, let's get through life now. No, God wants to build your faith. The Bible says this in Hebrews. It says, uh, without faith, that it's actually impossible to please God. You can't please God apart from having faith. And look what the Bible says, how we please God. There's two ways we do it. Number one, you must believe that he exists. And secondly, that he's a rewarder. How good is our God? He says, not only, what, what pleases me is not only that you believe in me, that you actually look up and see in me a rewarder when you seek me, that you believe that. If you seek God, he's going to reward you. A lot of people look up to heaven and they're like, man, God just wants to take stuff from me. He wants my money. He wants my time. He wants me to not have any fun. And God's, no, God is a reward. He's saying, I will. In fact, what pleases me is if you believe I want to reward you because it just reveals you know the goodness of my heart. And so that's the heart of our God. That's why we want to talk about building our faith. And why do we call it my story? Well, here's why, talking about five things that God uses to grow our faith. I call it, we called it my story because I have some friends that are either brand new to a Christian faith or are not yet Christians, and they'd say, I don't know what I believe. And as I hang out with these friends, they ask incredible questions like, what's the Bible all about? And as my friends ask these questions, I find myself answering with things, you know, yes, I'll give a theological answer if they want to know kind of how the Bible like structurally fits together. And, you know, that, that stuff's good to know. But I never stop there. It always gets to what does it mean for me personally? What's my story all about? And this is how Jesus would preach and teach in the New Testament. People would come to Jesus with a question and he would give a theological answer but then he would bust out a story or an illustration to make it come to life. Here's an example. In Matthew chapter 17, the disciples of Jesus, they can't cast out a demon. And so they come to Jesus and they're like, why couldn't we do this? And Jesus gave them a theological answer and he said, it's because you don't have enough faith. But then he went beyond that to kind of paint the picture of what faith looks like. And, and he said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, a tiny little seed, if you got faith like that, you can actually say to this mountain, get up and move, and it's going to move. 
And uh, scholars actually believe that Jesus was standing in view of Mount Herodian. Mount Herodian is actually the place where King Herod, a wicked king, had built his palace. Herod wanted to build a palace on the outside of the city where he could overlook and see everything. But there was actually two hills outside the city. They were about of equal size, and he didn't want to build his palace on a hill the same size as another hill nearby. He wanted to stand out and, and be in charge and just be higher than anything. And so he had his people dig down this mountain over here so they could build this one up higher so he could be above everything. And Jesus is standing in view of that mountain as he's saying to them, listen, if a little human effort could move that mountain from here to there for a wicked king, just imagine what you can do with a little bit of faith in the God who created the universe. So Jesus is telling stories and he's painting pictures. He's like, look right there. Look what humans' hands did. Now imagine what you can do with me. God wants to build our Faith. And so last week we talked about how God builds our faith through practical teaching. Say that with me. Say practical teaching. And what that was all about is that when we grow in faith, we, one of the ways God wants to grow your faith is just hearing his word taught in a way that you can actually apply in your life. And that's one of the reasons we show up to do church. There are many, but it's one of them why we just say, hey, we're consistently going to make this our custom. We're going to gather together. Why? Because when you hear God's word week to week, year to year, decade to decade, God is going to grow your faith simply through hearing his word with a responsive faith. God grows your faith through practical teaching. The second way God grows your faith, we're going to talk about this today, is through personal ministry. Say that with me. Say personal ministry. I've observed in my life that God so often will grow my faith, not through doing something great for me, but through doing something through me. That's how God will build. That's what I'm talking about when I say personal ministry, where God actually takes you and he uses you to do something great for his kingdom. Personal ministry. God will grow your faith when you're doing something for somebody else. Now, one of the things that I find hard to grasp about the Bible is that God is repeatedly teaching us and revealing to us that he is willing to use us before we look ready. Like, there is some stuff in the Bible, I just got to be honest with you, I know it's like maybe not all that pastorally popular to say, maybe not like what you hope your pastor will say on a Sunday, but can I be honest with you? There's stuff in the Bible I still find hard to grasp, and that's one of them. You think of my, our four-year-old, our oldest, Avia. She's got some stuff in the Bible that she loves and some stuff that's like super hard for her to grasp. The stuff she loves is uh, David and Goliath. She loves David and Goliath. I mean, she loves it almost too much. Last night, Rachel was putting her to bed. She told me this after she put Avia to bed. Avia wanted to go to bed. I'm not even making this up. I had written this message before this happened. Avia wanted to go to bed with her Bible open to the story of David and Goliath lying on her chest. I had written this illustration before she took it to the psycho next level. Let me just get it into my soul through osmosis. Avia's got multiple children's picture Bibles, okay? And she will tell us which one she wants to read David and Goliath from, from on a daily basis. Sometimes she'll say, she calls her Bible... It's, we're working on it. She calls her Bible Jesus, okay? And so she's like, I want to read uh, from, from the old Jesus tonight, which again, we got some theology to work on. Sometimes she'll say, I want to read David and Goliath from the new Jesus. The old Jesus, the new Jesus, it's all Jesus. She loves David and Goliath. And uh, last week I picked her up from preschool. She had her fist closed. She walks over to me. She goes, Daddy, today in the playground, I picked out five smooth stones. You watch out, man. She can be a conqueror. If you see Abby is swinging a sling, get your kids out of the way. She's ready. She's ready to go, especially if they're tall. <laughs> she can be a conqueror. Not surprisingly, though, at her age and stage, there's some stuff in the Bible she finds hard to grasp, right? Like, for example, Moses' mom putting him in a basket, pushing him down river and saying goodbye. It's hard to grasp at her age and stage, right? I don't even know why they put that one in the kid's Bible. Skip that one. That one's hard to explain. Every time I grab a basket, she's like, Daddy, no! <laughs> it's okay. Hard to grasp. I still have things in the Bible that are hard for me to grasp. For me, it's not the mountains moving 
Jesus saying, by faith, you can move a mountain. I have a hard time believing that. I've got faith for mountains moving in the name of Jesus. We were told we never have kids. We've got two. Mountains move in Jesus' name. And I paused this regularly scheduled uh, weekly sermon uh, to let you know a little bit of a family announcement. Uh, we actually have a third on the way. <laughs> That's upside down. I don't know if you noticed. Woo! <laughs> God moves mountains. And, uh, and, and I don't just believe that in my own life. I'm praying and speaking it over yours every day. God moves mountains. So that's not the stuff that's hard for me to grasp. I know we can jump back into the message at this point. I'm still a little bit excited, but let's get back on the tracks. <sighs> the stuff that's hard for me to grasp it's things like the Apostle Paul saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. I find it hard to grasp because in ministry, like I follow a lot of you know, friends that are in ministry and they pastor churches and I'll follow them on Instagram and I'll see their great churches. And I have this tendency to look at where people are at today and not know who they were yesterday and to think they were just always that influential. Because I, and maybe you find, maybe you look around the church and you see someone that God is using in some great way in ministry and you're like, they must have always been that influential. You don't see who they were when they got called. I find it hard to wrap my mind around this, that God wants everybody on the planet to be saved, and yet he picks his starting roster, according to Paul here in 1 Corinthians, using people, in God's words, that he says are not yet wise or influential. Now imagine that in a different context. It's as if God wanted to start a basketball team, and the salvation of the planet is depending on them winning this game, and it's Paul saying it's as if God were to line us up from shortest to tallest and start picking the shortest first. That's how God starts his roster. That's how God picks his team to make a difference on the planet, the salvation of the world. I find it hard to wrap my mind around that. So the main point of this message on how God will build your faith through personal ministry is this, that you're chosen by God. Everyone here, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are chosen by God, and God chose you because you're an underdog. Now, I think that there are people all over the room, uh, maybe this underdog message will resonate with you, especially because you're Canadian. Like this, the underdog thing, we get the underdog thing, right? Like, when our athletes go to the Olympics and they win medals, even they're surprised. Like, <laughs> we're a nation of underdogs. And even in the church. When I invite my neighbors to church for the 15th time, and they're like, well, we can't this weekend because we got gymnastics and soccer, and it's like the only sunny Sunday for eight weeks. I kind of feel like throwing up my hands and be like, God, is there a different city? Like, some, some people that actually know they want more than just the dead life? that they're living from Monday to Friday to Saturday to Sunday to kind of cope to get through the next Monday to Friday? Is there another place I could go where some people actually know that they need more to this life? But here's a message I have for us, Resonate Church, and even for the church in Canada, that God has chosen the church in Canada, and God has chosen us, Resonate Church, to make a difference in this city. And God hasn't chosen us, God hasn't chosen you, because it even looks like our city is primed for a miracle, but because God chooses the underdog. Because God chose David, come on, as Abby has got that thing and she's pumped up, he chose David to slay Goliath. Come on, the Abraham story, he chose a 100-year-old couple to have a baby. The Paul story, God chose a murderer as an apostle. And so when we invite our city to our church and they say, probably not this weekend and probably not ever. Or when you look at your son or your daughter who's currently not serving God and they say, I don't want to go to church with you today, mom and dad. We should not look up to heaven with a look of loss or disappointment, but with a bit of a smirk on our face that says, I know that you've chosen to do your best work in the places that look least possible through the least likely people. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called by God. Now, I think there's actually three different places you could find yourself at if you're in the room today and, and, uh, and it relates to personal ministry. Here's the first one. I know that there's a lot of you and you know the gift that God's put on your life and 
You see God using it on a regular basis and you believe, you're full of faith, that God is growing your faith through personal ministry. You see him using you. you some, sometimes it might be hard work. Sometimes you got to get up early. Sometimes it's a little bit of a grind. But when you step back and you look at it, you're like, I know God is growing my faith because I'm engaged in the calling that he put on my life. That's, I believe, one group or one category that you might find yourself in today. A second category that I know that, that you're in church today, and it would be that you want God to use you in his call on your life. But right now you just feel a little bit on the periphery. And the reason you feel on the periphery is just that it feels like a season or a time when it's just too busy. There's too much going on. There's something going on in your family or there's something really big going on in your work. And the reason I know this space so well is I've spent years of my life feeling like I was on the periphery because something going on in my life or in my business or in my family felt too big for me to engage fully in God's call on my life. And I want to speak to anyone that you find yourself in that place. And I, I heard this at Art Conference. It's a quote from Pastor Carl Lentz, and I think it's so good. It's this, it's don't make enemies of things that aren't enemies. So your family time and your ministry life are not enemies. In fact, your family time is going to be enriched when you know that you're living with purpose. Every day you wake up with meaning. Your heart is swelling because you just have a, the purpose and the fullness of destiny of God on your life. Don't make enemies of family time in church. Don't make enemies of your business and being engaged in the ministry and call that God's put on your life. Understand that it, there is an element of faith growth that you can only discover when your hands and your voice are being used to build the kingdom of God. So that's where you be. You want it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to preach to get you to want to engage in that calling this morning. Uh, that, I actually believe you do want it. You're just wondering how it can happen. And today I'm just letting you know by faith, it, not only is it possible, God's, it, it bring your kids with you. Like when it, just bring them with you when you're serving. Like I, this morning as we, we, we showed up early for rally and the kids were in rally, oftentimes I'll go around the room during rally. Listen, just bring your kids. I'll go around the room. I'll start praying for people. Avia is usually wanting to cling to me and, and now they're both wanting to cling to me. They're both going to be daddy's girls. Sorry, mom. My, uh, it's, it's just like... So I'll be carrying Avia around and I'll be praying for people on the team. And Avia will just stretch out her hands and start praying for people. And this is a Pentecostal church. We believe in, in the gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues. I speak in tongues all the time. And so I'll be praying for people speaking in tongues, which to our natural ears just doesn't sound like anything that makes sense. Sometimes Avia will just like do her version of tongues while we're praying for people. I don't know if it's real. I don't know if it counts. Find out later. Bring them with you on the journey. Come on, begin to see God use your kids. Let them know, hey, if you're going to wave a sign out at the road, take your nine-year-old out there with you. Let them wave a sign. They're going to be happier than you are doing it. People are going to be stoked to see them, not you. It's just the way it is. Bring them on the journey. Bring them to conferences. Bring them to rally. Bring them to small group. Come on, somebody. Engage them because your heart is going to swell with purpose, and they're going to see it. They're going to live richer, bigger lives. Come on, somebody. You want it. That's the second group. You feel like you're on the periphery. How do we engage? Lastly, there's a group of people, and I, and I, I count myself among this group many times. And it's the group that you would say you want to engage in God's calling and God's purposes. But you know what? You just don't feel like you're qualified. Five years ago when Rachel and I went to our first ARC conference, it was in Jacksonville, Florida. And as we were there, and ARC is a church planting organization, and we're listening to them talking about planting churches, and we're just like, wow, oh, God, you kind of seem to be putting a vision in our minds for a church that we feel like we're supposed to lead. We don't know what we're supposed to do with that right now. As God was speaking that vision to our hearts, we had never felt more underqualified. Soon after that conference, Rachel's mom was going to pass away from cancer at the age of 54, and it was like a grief bomb went off in our house. I remember I was supposed to be speaking on marriage on a Sunday morning in our church at the time. And as I said, we had this grief bomb going off in our house. And so on the Saturday night, before I'm to speak on marriage, we got into a large, uh, let's call it disagreement. <laughs> we could call it a fight, but this is church, so let's refer to it as a bit of a disagreement. Now, I remember this disagreement pretty well because Rachel went upstairs we kind of got to that moment where we're like okay we're not really getting through this and so she goes upstairs and I go to the couch and I begin to call out to God and I'm like God help us get through this disconnect and then I did something really dumb I punched a couch cushion now punching couch cushions is always dumb it's especially dumb 
if you haven't warmed up because I dislocated my shoulder, <laughs> punching the couch cushion. So there I was 12 hours later, preaching on marriage, holding the microphone in my wrong hand with my largely numb right arm down at the side. And I'm just like, what are my points even going to be? Like, if you want to have a great marriage, buy great cushions. <laughs> now tell that story. To be able to say, I'm so thankful that when God called us to start Resonate Church, he didn't look for the couple that had it all together. And he didn't look for the ones that were wisest and most influential. What God found was a couple of underdogs that believed in his finished work on the cross of Jesus Christ. Our resume before God at that time had, and it still to this day has, only two lines on it. The first thing is yes to your call. And the second line is yes to your desire to use us not as we are today, but who you've called us to be. You see, last week is not who you have to be this week. And today is not who you have to be tomorrow. When we were in our, our pre-launch season of the church and we began to try and do some fundraising to launch Resonate Church out of Christian Life Assembly, I was a little bit, I got to be honest with you, I was semi-panicked about the fundraising portion of this whole endeavor. Um, I, I remember in June of that year, I was researching on Amazon like books to figure out how to do fundraising and I'm like, well, the books were like 400 pages and I'm like, I don't, ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, <laughs> And so I'm like, well, what, I guess, how am I going to do this thing? I remember thinking, and then we started our fundraising campaigns, and I had I'd done research, I'd, uh, I'd read, I'd watched videos, I'd kind of done the best I could to be equipped, but then we started fundraising, and people we thought were going to give weren't giving, and we're like, well, what do we do with this? And we found ourselves in one of these ministry moments or life moments, and maybe you find yourself in these moments from time to time if you're a couple, and it's one of these moments where you're like, which one of us is going to be uh, strong right now, uh, which one of us is actually going to cry and say, there's no way we can get through this? You know, it's kind of the back and forth. And like, hopefully you're not both crying and saying we should give up at the same time. Like, hopefully one of you is able to be like, you started crying first, so thus I will be strong, right? Because that's, that's kind of how it works. So Rachel started crying first, which is actually abnormal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And so I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to be strong tonight. And she's like, we should give up. And I'm like, no, we're going to be strong. If God's called us to do it, he's going to provide. And through mascara, we were supposed to go meet with a couple that night that we were going to be casting vision to them and being like, come on, would you like to partner with us financially? Rachel's got the mascara rolling down her cheeks. And she's like, we sh I don't even want to go to dinner right now. And I'm like, well, we're going to be late. I'm going to leave right now. You redo the mascara, the makeup. Uh, you don't even need makeup. You're gorgeous. But whatever. I, like, I don't, probably, probably didn't say that, but it came to me now as maybe it's a way to try and make up for the dislocated shoulder. Now, so I was, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go there and you, you get your makeup done and meet me there. And so, so I get to the restaurant with a couple. I'm not wanting to start casting vision until she gets there because in general, as I said, she is the strong one. And so I'm like, I'm going to wait for her to get here. So she comes and she sits down and it's just like, I don't even know what we're going to say. We've just, we've just been back and forth as to whether or not we feel like this, we can even keep going. Before we can even begin to cast vision, this couple across the table, they looked at us and they said, uh, God spoke something crazy to us today. And God told us, he put a number into our hearts. We're supposed to invest $40,000 into the start of your church. They don't even go here. God put that number in their heart. They did sow that into the life of our church. I tell all these stories to say we've... As God is growing our faith, what's, God, what's God's desire for us? God, God is looking for some underdogs who will just stand up and say, God, I'm going to take the step of faith that you've got for me to engage in personal ministry. I think today we need to do what the Apostle Paul tells us to do. And it's to say, uh, it's to say look at who I was when I was called. Maybe you're here and you're like, I don't even, am I called by God? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, there is a calling on your life. There is a, there's a purpose to you. God made you with purpose. His hand is upon you. The Bible says that you are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus uh, for good works, which God prepared beforehand, which means that before God even made you, He knew what your destiny was. He put a gift on your life. That's why the centerpiece of our next steps is not telling you what we need people to do in our church. It's discovering the gift that's on your life. 87% of Christians don't even know the gift that's on their life. Little wonder that we're so, uh, that we're so uh, anemic in destiny at times, wondering what we're supposed to do. No, we want to actually have you understand the gift and purpose God put on your life because your gift reveals your destiny. God put something on your life and he has called you.
he hasn't called the wisest and most influential. Paul goes on and he says he doesn't need the noble. He doesn't need the strong. But he's actually chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And he's chosen the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He's chosen the lowly things and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are why. So that none of us ever get to boast before him. It's always for his glory, not ours. That's why he doesn't look for the wise. That's why he starts picking with the short. He's not looking for the strongest, most influential. He's just looking for some underdogs to stand up and say yes to your calling and yes to your desire, not to use me as who I am even today, but who you've called me to be in my future. So this morning, I'm going to invite you all over the room to stand. And we're going to go back into a time of worship. And if today in your heart, there is a yes resonating saying, yeah, I'm going to take a next step into your plan and into your purpose to use me. I might not even know what it looks like. But if today there's a yes to step into personal ministry that God has for you, I'm going to invite you to raise your hands and begin to worship with all you have. God, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is upon us. We lean into you today in Jesus' name. Oh 
about you just bow your heads with me for a moment, just for a moment of privacy for some people in the room. Because even though we haven't spoken a message on salvation today, there are some people in the room, and today I know you, you want to take a next step in your faith. And for you, that next step is not yet personal ministry. It's the first step of saying Jesus is the Lord of my life. And so if that's you, you're here today and you're saying, today I need to make that decision. I want to be forgiven of my past. No, I've got a home in heaven and be restored to right relationship with God. The Bible says, by faith in what Jesus has done for you on the cross, you can be saved. In fact, become a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. So if today that's you and you'd say, yeah, I don't want to leave this place the same way I came in, but today I want to make a decision to wholeheartedly surrender my life to Jesus Christ. If that's you, I'm going to ask you, in a moment to raise your hand. We won't center you out. No one will be looking around. That's just a moment between you and God. And you're saying, yeah, today I make that decision. We won't center you out or call you forward or embarrass you in any way. This is between you and God. If that's you today, you'd say, yeah, today my decision to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Would you just raise your hand, hold it high for just a moment. We're going to pray together before we close our service today. Man, I just know God's pulling at hearts today and he's called you and his hand is upon you and today is a moment of decision. Today is your moment of decision. So whether you raise your hand or today that decision was in your heart and you didn't, you didn't raise your hand but you want to make that decision today, just pray this with me and come on, resonate family, help me out with this. Say, dear Jesus, I'm giving you my whole heart today. I'm going to choose to follow you because I believe you love me. You died for me so I could be totally forgiven, free, full of life, eternal and abundant. In Jesus' name, I receive you by faith. Come on, church, can we put our hands together for those who made that decision today?